you're remembering, especially today. Will you find a comfortable place in your seat? Take a few easy breaths as we settled in our shared silence together. Please join me in this prayer written by Jude Geiger. Spirit of life, God of many names, source of hope. We come together at the end of another week, some worn down by struggles of health, of home or work. May we be a community that makes space for the sharing of joys and sorrows, angers and hopes, with grace and forbearance. In our nation's life, we pause this holiday weekend to remember the Native American lives lost from European colonization on what is now our soil. Teach us to remember our history. Though we cannot make amends for what has come before, may we learn from those ways never to repeat them in our lives today. May we develop new ways of relating to neighbor and stranger without violence or coercion, deceit or greed. Mother of Grace, help us to find a sense of humility where we have privilege and strength where we face oppression. In our struggles, may we learn compassion and in our power, may we learn temperance. As a community of faith, may we be a safe harbor in a world that is often harsh toward difference. Challenge us to use our presence as a healing force for justice and equity. Knowing that although we've come far in the civil rights struggle of our times, there are many people that are still left behind and the work of building the beloved community is just as pressing as ever before. We ask these things for ourselves, for those we love, and for those we do not love. Blessed be and amen. Our anthem is one, our world is one world. Thank mm -hmm.
From Lies My Teacher Told Me by James Lowen. Not understanding their past renders many Americans incapable of thinking effectively about our present and future. American history is full of fantastic and important stories with the power to spellbind. They show what America has been about and are directly relevant to our present society. Yet they are so poorly presented in textbooks that they put students to sleep. Nationalism is one of the reasons why history textbooks are so bad. They try to inculcate blind patriotism, starting with the textbook names, the Great Republic, Land of Promise, Triumph of the American Nation. They emphasize facts, but leave out most of what we need to know about the past, and some of the factoids are flatly wrong. The facts aren't remembered because they're presented simply as one damn thing after another to memorize. They stifle the meaning of events. Students are not taught to practice thinking coherently about the life of our society. A college student said, in retrospect, I wonder, why didn't I think to ask, for example, who were the original inhabitants of the Americas? What was their life like? And how did it change when Columbus arrived? But in high school, everything was presented as if it were the full picture, so I never thought to doubt that it was. More than any other topic, history is about us. Whether one deems our present society wondrous or awful or both, history reveals how we arrived at this point. Understanding our past is central to our ability to understand ourselves and the world around us. The history in this book has a very different perspective than the one that I was taught in school. It's not pleasant. Many of you will have the same initial reaction that I had. My mind didn't want to accept what I was hearing. However, a true history is more than a perspective. It's about what actually happened. So, two conflicting stories, one that I was taught, one I was reading. I identify as a scientist. Basically, the job of a scientist is to seek knowledge and freedom, as we say in our affirmation. As such, I'm skeptical of information that conflicts with what I've already heard, considered, and accepted. I'm also obligated to consider new credible information. To be credible, there has to be solid evidence. That's essential. What's the evidence in this book? about 100 pages of detailed footnotes and references, what the colonists recorded about what they did in order to be done, what the indigenous people recorded about what they did and what happened to them, the treaties, what they say and what actually happened, and what's called ground truth, some of which takes archaeology, some is visible to undistracted bare eyes. Put aside what the colonists wanted their descendants to know, retaining what they actually did according to their own records. Then the history picture comes together again. It's different than what I was taught and unpleasant, but thoroughly documented and consistent with the evidence. Truth is better than fiction. Knowledge is empowering. It's only with knowledge that we can begin to end the legacy of our common history. Today we explore the story we were told about the founding of this nation and the story we were not told. People like happy stories, stories about heroes and heroines. We don't like stories about violence or pain, fear or despair. When stories contain injustice, we change them, or we don't tell them at all. 
but it is our nature to be curious. When we are curious, we seek out the truth, even if it's uncomfortable. We educate ourselves. We listen to marginalized voices. Knowledge is power. Knowledge lights a spark of compassion inside us that makes us want to offer ourselves in service. Let's examine what we were taught. In school, we learn that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. We learn about the Mayflower, the ship that brought brave industrious settlers to Plymouth Rock. These settlers befriended Native Americans. There were marriages, think of Pocahontas. There was exploration and westward expansion into a pristine wilderness. Think of Sacagawea helping Lewis and Clark. Those are the stories we are taught in school. That the country we know today is a melting pot of cultures, with each minority gifting their talents to make America beautiful. What an exciting, heartwarming story. Now let's be curious. Who was here before 1492? What was their life like? How do we know? Humans were hunter-gatherers until they began domesticating plants. This happened around 8,500 BC in seven locales around the globe. Three of the seven were in the Americas and based upon corn. The Valley of Mexico, the South Central Andes in South America, and in Eastern North America. The other early agricultural centers were in the Tigris Euphrates and Nile River systems, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Yellow River of Northern China, and the Yangtze River of Southern China. We can track human activity on this continent by following corn agriculture. Corn does not grow wild without support of human care. There is evidence of cultivated corn as early as 10,000 years ago on this continent. It was cultivated in arid desert regions using complex irrigation systems. One canal system from 900 AD stretched 800 miles. Indigenous Americans were stewards of the land, living in harmony with nature. A report from 1669 noted that six square miles of cornfields surrounded each Iroquois village. Corn was planted in hills using two other plants in a symbiotic system known as the Three Sisters. Corn stalks supported beans, which fixed nitrogen in the soil, which was shaded by squash plants. Native Americans managed wildlife instead of domesticating it, creating havens to attract game. They would burn away underbrush, allowing soft young grasses to grow. An observer in 1419 said, rather than the thick unbroken snarl of trees imagined by Thoreau, the great eastern forest was an ecological kaleidoscope of garden plots, blackberry rambles, pine barrens, and spacious groves of chestnut, hickory, and oak. Herds of buffalo roamed from New York to Georgia, nurtured and supported by the natives. When they hunted buffalo, they were harvesting a foodstuff which they had consciously been instrumental in creating. At the end of the 15th century, central Mexico supported 30 million people. There was a relative lack of disease, in part because of the unheard of habit of daily bathing. Observers notice that the native people go to the river and plunge in and wash themselves before they dress daily. Cahokia was a city-state in the Mississippi Valley during the 12th century, supporting tens of thousands of people, larger than London at the same time period. A complex system of roads became what is now our highway system. There was travel, trade, and government. This is what the continent looked like before European settlers arrived. If we are curious, we would ask, where are these great cities now? Why have we not heard of these advanced civilizations? Because while people on this continent were trading and farming, a great evil was growing in Europe. Settler colonialism. 
invasion, murder, and theft in the name of God. This practice started in the 11th century across the European continent and was perfected during the Crusades. Let's discuss the doctrine of discovery. The idea that what I come across is mine. I can claim it because I discovered it. Imagine if I walked into my neighbor's home and declared that it was mine. That is what Europeans did when they landed here. They discovered this land and claimed it. Please note that the Catholic Church has never renounced the doctrine of discovery. The, U the UUA has. These settlers believed that God had led them to their promised land, that the land was their reward. This is the concept of manifest destiny, a 19th century belief that the United States was destined by God to expand its dominion and spread democracy and capitalism across the entire North American continent. What about the people on this newly discovered land that God had gifted to the European settlers? They were killed in an organized, officially sanctioned genocide. Not just warriors, but women, children, elders. Their livestock was killed, their crops burned, their villages razed to the scorched earth. Survivors were driven to unlivable land, often without water. These are the practices that colonial settlers brought across the sea from Europe, from the Crusades to the Americas, on the Mayflower in 1492. This is not a happy story, but it is the truth. In his book, Stamped, Racism, Anti-Racism, and You, and you <clears throat> Jason Reynolds and Ibram Kendi describe two types of racism. The first is segregationism. In this, the other is considered not fully human and thus should be killed or at least kept away from decent people. Carol talked about the early parts of European settler colonialism when segregationalism dominated the country's relationship to native people. The second type of racism is assimilation, which accepts that the other can be considered fully, fully human, but only if they give up their own culture and adopt the culture of those in power. <clears throat> Around 1876, the United States policy towards Native Americans shifted from segregation to assimilation. The policy was first articulated by Richard Pratt, who founded the first Indian boarding school. Instead of saying, the only good Indian is a dead Indian, the policy became, kill the Indian to save the man. There were many things that were done to force assimilation from forced conversion to Christianity, to the move to take land out of common ownership, to policies that gave short-term rewards to Indians to move off of the reservation and into urban settings, to forbidding the practice of native religions. Remnants of those things still exist. For example, while priests are permitted to bring wine into prisons to celebrate the Eucharist, native spiritual leaders are frequently not permitted to bring in tobacco for those traditional ceremonies, nor to offer the cleansing sweat. However, the most egregious assimilationism may have been the Indian boarding schools. When the children got there, they were taken out of their native clothing and put in Western clothing. The boys had their hair cut. This, by the way, continues in some communities where um, schools will require native boys to keep their hair short. Even the long hair is part of the spiritual practice for many. They were punished if they spoke their own language, frequently the only language they knew when they first arrived, and forbidden to practice their traditional religions. They were taught to be ashamed. Some parents sent their schools, their children to these schools voluntarily, <clears throat> or at least semi-voluntarily. They were offered a carrot, told that their children would be fed and cared for at the boarding school. 
If that didn't work, they were offered a stick. If they did not send the children away, the allotments of food they were promised when they were moved on to the inhospitable reservations would be withheld. In other cases, the children were literally kidnapped. My mother tells me that there was a train that used to go through Fond du Lac, the reservation at which I'm enrolled, on a regular weekly schedule. The man on the train started throwing candy to the children. And it didn't take long for the kids to start to anticipate the train. And before long, they would all be out waiting for the train every week. One week, the train stopped. Many men got off and they grabbed the children, put them on the train, and took them away to boarding schools. These boarding schools were often run by churches, and I have no doubt that many of the people who were involved were well-intentioned. But there was always danger in thinking we are helping whenever we disregard the wishes of those we are attempting to help. Our own hands are not clean in this, Unitarians participated in assimilation efforts, running schools in at least two places. During the 2009 General Assembly, the Reverend William Sinkford, then president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, told a story of Unitarian interference with the Ute nation. He went on to offer a formal apology, which was accepted by two of the tribal leaders who were in attendance. And he went on to describe the work of truth-telling and reconciliation. His presentation is readily available online. Even when the worst of the boarding school excesses were stopped, the U.S. has continued to remove children from Native families. Children were taken away from their homes by social workers saying the children were being neglected or abused and placed in white foster or adoptive homes. My father's younger siblings, sometime in the 1950s, I believe, were removed from my grandmother's home and placed in an orphanage run by the Catholic Church. I don't know much of their experience. My aunts and uncles didn't talk about it much. In the 1970s, there was a study that showed that 25 to 35 percent of all Indian children were removed from their homes, and 85 to 95 percent of those children ended up in non-native settings. In 1978, the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed to make it harder to remove Indian children from their communities. That act is not always followed, and there continue to be many critics of the act. Even now, courts are being asked to overturn this act, saying that it is unfair as it creates a two-tiered system for foster care. Um, I might be more receptive to this argument if white children were ever removed from their families and placed with families on reservations, but I digress. So what can we do now? First, keep being curious and willing to learn history that is uncomfortable. Um, as an aside, I was surprised by the reaction to others as they read this book. Um, much of this book was already familiar to me, not necessarily all the details and therefore not shocking. I heard the stories growing up. I read some of the books that, um, that she cites. Tell other people what you've learned. If you have kids in school and they come home this week with the pretty Indian pilgrim story about the first Thanksgiving, tell them that the real story is not that nice and consider talking to the teacher about how damaging that story is for some of us. I was helping a first grader last week and was delighted that instead of that story, they were looking at pre-Columbian civilizations in the Americas. I, by the way, am delighted to celebrate Thanksgiving. Cultures all over the world have celebrated harvest festivals as a time to be thankful for the bounty of the earth. And besides, who doesn't like a holiday whose main point is to eat? So be thankful, eat hearty, and this year, avoid gatherings. We can also stay politically engaged with the issues that affect the native population. There are far too many to enumerate. Finally, Rod Swanger has put together a list of charitable organizations that are helping in native communities. They were in th Thursday's newsletter and will be on one of the slides during the announcements. Before we move on to our closing hymn, 
I want to share one last story. The Reverend Danielle DeBona, a Wampanoag Indian and UU minister, attended the service of living tradition during General Assembly in Portland. The program included the hymn, We'll Build a Land. When she saw hundreds of mostly white faces in the hall singing this, she thought about how Europeans had indeed built on native land, which caused her some pain. She shared her feelings with Heath Arnold, who had helped plan the service and was president of the Unitarian Universalist Musicians Network. He initially replied that he would never sing that song again, but Debona assured him that he could now that she had been heard. I have always loved this song and will continue to use it in worship. But I encourage you to hear this as well as many of our other songs with open ears and considering considering how other people might hear it. So please join me now in singing We'll Build the Land. The words will be on the screen. <laughs> 